Good morning, everyone. My name is Doris, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are present here this morning, whether you attend regularly or if this is your very first time. We're so happy you put in the effort to join us today, and we also want to welcome everyone who is watching online. I would like to take a moment to recap the masking policy here at CIT. The church is asking everyone in, when you're in this auditorium to please wear a mask and to wear it properly. There are dear brothers and sisters with elevated health concerns who attend our meeting. We want to mitigate potential risks so everyone feels as comfortable and safe as possible when joining us on a Sunday morning. Perhaps we could look at this masking policy through the lens of Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And then I'd also like to just read a headline from a news channel that appeared this week. It said, COVID-19 hospitalizations in Ontario reach five-month high as top health official warns of a complex and difficult winter. Dr. Moore also said, COVID is not going away. It is a formidable foe. So let's persevere a little longer. Let us love one another as we respect CIT's masking policy. And if you didn't bring a bass today, don't worry. The ushers have an ample supply. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's focus on the real mission of CIT. That mission is to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Prayer is one very effective way for you to partner with this mission. Everyone can pray, and you can pray at any time and any place. You can also partner with us by making a financial donation. To make an online donation, you can go to mycit.info and click on giving. If you prefer the old-fashioned way of giving, there is an offering box just outside the back doors of this auditorium. However you partner with the CIT mission, we thank you for your support. After the message this morning, there will be a special announcement focusing on an upcoming event. Be sure to give it your full attention so you don't miss any of the details. And after the meeting is over, stay a little longer and join us for some fellowship and refreshments in the cafe across the hall. So that's it for me. I thank you for your grace this morning, and I will hand the stage over to the worship team. Thank you, Sister Doris. I'm going to ask everybody here to stand, and let's prepare our hearts to worship the King of Kings this morning. He deserves all the praise and the glory.
Father, we just wanted to thank you for this wonderful day. You are our unchanging God. You are king then, you are king now. And we worship you, O Lord God, in your splendor and majesty. Because you alone, O Lord God, are glory to be praised. And we praise you with all our hearts, O Lord God. In humility, we bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. church.
we'll sing that over and over again, oh Lord God, because whatever that we are going through, oh Lord God, you are able and you are exceedingly and abundantly generous, oh Lord God, and merciful towards us. And so we worship you, Lord God, and we humble ourselves, oh Lord God, to your to your holiness and to your might, mighty works and splendor. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. exalted over all. We praise you this morning. Lord, we pray that this morning we would be here uh, touched by you, touched by your sacrifice, influenced by you, controlled by you. Lord, speak to each one of us this morning the word that you have for each one. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, welcome in person and online. Uh, we're continuing in, our, in the book of Philippians, which we've been in for, this is now the 28th week. Um, we're just 
going along slowly, gradually, and allowing the Lord to give us uh, insight as we go along. Today, the title of today's message is Paul's Honesty and Resolve. Paul's Honesty and Resolve. And the verses we're covering today are, or maybe we should say the verses we're trying to uncover today are Philippians 3, 12 to 16. Let me read them for you. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to, like ho to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's upward call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way, and if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. As some say, this is God's word. It is God's word, right? So this section, um, commonly, often you hear sermons given on this section, and they use this section to uh, promote the thought that we should be the best that we can be in whatever we do. We should strive for success in whatever we do. So do your best. Strive to do your best. What is the result of that kind of thought? That thought is, I'm always progressing and I'm always going upward. Is a mindset of upward mobility. Now, is there anything wrong with doing your best? No. Is there anything wrong with striving? No. But that's, the thought of upward mobility is not the thought here in this section. Paul's thought here, these verses we have to remember are a direct continuation of what we have been covering previously last week and the week before and even in this whole book in chapter 2. What is the previous section, especially verse 10? It says, knowing the power of his resurrection, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings, and being conformed to his death. Let me ask you, does that sound like upward mobility? Fellowship in sufferings, conformed to his death. Does that sound like upward mobility? The pathway that Paul took is the same pathway of Christ. In chapter 2, he talks about Christ humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death on the cross. This is the master story of Christ. He what? He had equality with God, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself to the point of death. Then God exalted him. Christ's pathway that he took was the downward path. And Paul has the same thought concerning himself. What is his pathway? His pathway is, yes, I know the power of his resurrection, which sounds kind of big. We're going to touch at this a little bit later. But he talks about fellowship of his sufferings conformed to his death. The whole thought of Paul here is not upward mobility, but downward the way forward is the way downward. This is contrary to everything that we like, everything that is our society promotes. Paul's goal is not upward mobility, but it is knowing Christ, which means this pathway takes him downward. And I think it's safe to say this. Paul's ministry was empowered by this downward pathway. That doesn't seem to make sense to us. 
But Paul was empowered. Why? Because he, the pathway he took was the same path of Christ. Michael Gorman says this about uh, not just these verses, but also of Philippians chapter 2, which is the pathway of Christ. From its use in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, we see that Paul clearly intends his readers to interpret this humiliation, exaltation, the pathway, the master story, this pattern as the pattern of believers' existence too. The story of the Messiah as one of downward mobility. Christ's pathway was humbling himself. As believers, our pathway should be the same. There's a man, his name is Albert Simpson, or he was mainly known by A.B. Simpson. Uh, he's the founder or considered to be the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance movement, which is today now just called the Alliance Church. But probably a lot of people who go to the Alliance Church don't even know who A.B. Simpson was. But anyway, he wrote a number of hymns, and I'd like to point out one hymn, part of one hymn that he wrote, which I would say uh, covers this matter in Philippians uh, and elsewhere, but especially Philippians. He says this in one stanza of his, "'Tis not hard to die with Jesus or die with Christ when his risen life we know, dying and resurrection. It's not hard to share his sufferings, when our hearts with joy are flow. In his resurrection power, he has come to dwell in me, and my heart is gladly going, where? All the way to Calvary, downward, not upward. So another stanza. If we die, we'll live with, Christ, with Jesus. If we suffer, we shall reign. Only thus the prize of glory can the conqueror attain. Oh, how sweet on that glad morning should the master say to thee, Yes, my child, thou didst go with me to the mountain. No. All the way to Calvary. And the stanza is, All the way to Calvary where my Savior went for me. Help me, Lord, to go with thee all the way to Calvary. What is this? This is being conformed to his death. A.B. Simpson realized this, wrote this great hymn on this matter. So let's come back to our title, Paul's uh, Honesty and Paul's uh, Response. First of all, Paul's Honesty. Paul had an honest evaluation of himself and his situation. An honest evaluation. You know, this is not easy for us to do. Most of us are not often very honest with ourselves. We have... Either an inflated or a overly deflated view of ourselves. It's not honest. But Paul's honesty here is striking, I think. So he says, verse 12, first part of verse 12, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect. This word perfect could also mean mature. Beginning of verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I have not arrived. I have not arrived. I am a work in progress. I'm in the process. He's not reached the goal. He's not yet mature. He's not fully taken hold of the goal. He's still in the process. This matter of taking hold of is kind of the thought of, I haven't grasped it. I haven't fully obtained it. I haven't fully grasped it. I haven't fully made it my own. Paul does not claim to have reached sinless perfection. He's in the process of reaching the goal. So, what is the goal? What is the goal? Well, actually, we touched it last week already, but let me just reiterate what is the goal. Basically, it's verse 10. The goal is to know him, to know the power of his resurrection, to know the fellowship of his sufferings, 
and to be conformed to his death. To know him, to know the power of his resurrection, to know the fellowship of his sufferings, be conformed to his death. I'd like to just briefly say something about this matter of when you, the power of his resurrection, when you think about this phrase, to know the power of his resurrection, what comes to your mind? What do you think about? I think most of us have the thought, oh, the power of his resurrection, this is something big, this is something um, miraculous, this is something like dynamite blowing up rock. I'd like to ask you this question. How many times have you experienced that kind of thing? Maybe once in a while, but not often. I would say this. What is the power of his resurrection? I would say this. It's in when we experience in difficult situations... There is a holding, there's something holding us. And we don't even know how we make it through. But something is holding us. Something is sustaining us. There's a power that's holding us, keeping us, when we should be falling apart or not making it. To me, that's resurrection. That's the power of resurrection. And we may not always resurrect, we may not always realize it because we think, we think power of his resurrection should be so big and so momentous. About four years into my wife's illness, my sister-in-law one time came to me and she said, how are you doing this? How are you handling this? It's like this is ongoing year after year. How are you handling this? And I took the opportunity to tell you, tell her. I said, I'm doing this because of the grace of God. It's God's grace that is sustaining me. God's grace that is upholding me. I don't know how else I'm doing it. I would say, actually, what was that? That was the power of his resurrection. Now, just remember this. Resurrection is preceded by something. Resurrection is preceded by death. And death is a kind of suffering. When we're in difficult situations, what is it that holds us up? Last week, Ian mentioned Johnny Erickson Tata and her experience. What does she experience in her suffering of being a, not only a quadriplegic, but a quadriplegic who mysteriously has pain a lot of the time? What is sustaining her? It's the power of his resurrection. Does the power of his resurrection make her walk again? No. Not in this life. But what is she sustained by? She's sustained by the power of his resurrection. Sorry for that diversion. To know the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, it's interesting. On Friday night uh, in our small group, we had two couples in our group. Both couples are recent immigrants to Canada. And they left their country. Good jobs, good situations. They weren't running away from some... They weren't refugees, but they decided to come to Canada. And both couples have suffered in different ways. But what was interesting, both couples had this to say. The suffering produced something in them that was they didn't have before. Suffering produced something. They got to know God deeper. They got to know him in their sufferings. 
The wife said concerning her husband, he's a much nicer man now. Suffering made him a nicer man. When everything went well, his temper was not so great. When things are difficult, something changed in him. Why? And I would say it's this. Because in both cases, both couples' cases, they allowed God to do something in their life in the sufferings. Not everybody who passes through suffering has a positive result. But if we allow ourselves to be pressed into God in our sufferings, something will be produced when we have that kind, when we have that kind of fellowship of his sufferings. So, Paul says, chapter 3, 11 and 12, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect. perfect. So, Paul's, what is Paul's realization of himself? I haven't made it. I haven't arrived. But there's one last thing that Paul has a realization, and I think this is important, and that is this. He says in verse 12, I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. I have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Let me ask you, do you have this kind of realization? Jesus has taken hold of me. Jesus has taken hold of me. I didn't just receive salvation. But in that salvation receiving... Jesus took hold of me. A strong realization. And this thought of Paul's comes up mentioned different ways in his writings. In Galatians, he says, I live by the faithfulness of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loved me, gave himself for me. I've been taken hold of by that one. I've been grasped by that one. This was his realization. So this kind of realization that he's been taken hold of by Christ created a motivation within Paul to live differently. It's based upon Christ's sacrifice, Christ laying hold of him that Paul has a response or a resolve to what? To live differently. So his realization, I haven't made it. I'm a work in progress. And Christ has laid hold of me. So what is Paul's resolve? Well, he says he, he makes every effort to take hold of what he was taken hold of for. So Paul is very decisive. He is in pursuit. He's chasing, or you could say he is running after. He's determined. He's pressing on to lay hold of, to apprehend that for which Christ took hold of him or apprehended him for. This thought, when you read this section, you realize this is not coasting. This is not coasting. This is, Paul is making some kind of effort. I think you could even say he's making a strenuous effort. He's making a stress, strenuous effort. We may think, we may, we may like the idea of let me coast. Let me just, let me just coast along here. Let me just, let's not have too much. Let me, let me, ma let my path be a path of just, you know, plateauing. But let's come back to this thought. There's this thought. Paul says, I want to lay hold 
or I want to apprehend of the very thing that I've been taken hold of for. So, okay, on the one hand, Paul's got this kind of a, a determination, strenuous effort. But the other side is this. God laid hold of him. We could call this what? We could call this God's divine activity. We have our activity, but there's also God's divine activity. The fact is, we cannot do this all by ourselves. We need God's divine activity in our activity, you might say. It's not all on our shoulders. There is God's divine activity. He laid a hold of us. Then we have a response, I laid hold of him. So who was first? It's God was first. God first laid hold of us. That's God's divine activity. Then, then after that, we have a response. God takes hold of us. Then we take hold of God. It begins with God's activity. First John says, we love because he first loved us. How can we love? He loved us first. He's the initiator. We are the responders. I have this quote from this guy called Dong Su Kim. Sounds rather Korean, right? This means that Paul can strenuously pursue the goal since Jesus has already taken hold of him for that purpose. Here Paul repeats the inseparable link between divine activity and human responsibility. His perseverance is not a lone battle apart from divine intervention. Again, I come back to this. What is it that holds you? Is it your effort or is it God? God initiates. We respond. How's your response? How are you responding to what God has done in you? Okay, so Paul has this one attitude or one action, one resolve to lay hold. Another in this section is to forget. To forget what is behind. To forget what is behind. So, you know, many Bible scholars say, well, what Paul is saying, forget behind. What's behind is Paul's previous life in Judaism. Well, I would say, yes, that's true. But I think it's more than that. Because if it's just Paul's previous life in Judaism, how do, how do we relate to that? I didn't have a previous life in Judaism. Don't know about you. I didn't persecute the church of God. I don't know about you. So what do I have to forget? Well, there's actually, you think about this. Anything that can hinder or frustrate our progress. And I would say this. It can be your successes. It can be your failures. It can, it can be your wins. It can be your losses. It can be your virtues. It can be your sins. It can be pay people's praise of you. It can be people's criticism of you. It's leaving, maybe another one is leaving the pathway of upward mobility. A mindset of upward mobility and taking the way of cruciformity, the way of the cross. Forgetting what is behind. Past successes, past failures, wins, losses, praises, criticisms, all the things of the past. Anything that would 
frustrate our progress, our advancing, our reaching toward the goal. So Paul says, I forget what's behind and I reach toward what is ahead. What is ahead? You know, a good illustration is uh, a race, a, a people running, right? And there's almost this athletic thought here that Paul has, stretching forward, reaching forward. If you have ever watched a race, either in person or online, and especially these, you know, quick races, the ones that, you know, the 100 meters or the 400 meter relay, at the very end of the race, near the end of the race, what do you see? The runners, they lean forward to try and make sure their chest touches that line before anybody else. is stretching forward. They're putting every effort into that race to reach the goal, stretching forward, straining even to go forward. This is the thought Paul has here. The, his thought is, I am straining, making every effort to reach that goal. It's a forward looking, not looking back. If you have ever seen a 100 meter dash, or whatever they call it, uh, actually not 100 meter, probably more like a 200 or a 400, where they have to go all the way around the track, not just straight line. When you notice that, all the runners are staggered, right? The one on the inside is here, then the next one here, and the one on the far outside is way out here. The one on the outside actually cannot see all the other runners. They are blind running, or they're a blind runner. Now, what is the temptation when you're three quarters of the way through that race, that guy on the outside, that, that runner on the outside? What is the temptation of that runner? To look back, where's everybody else? Where am I in this race in comparison to everybody else? What will that do to that runner? That will slow that runner down. The best is just keep running. Don't look back and don't compare yourself to others. Sometimes you hear uh, runners who are interviewed at the end, who have not run the won the race. But sometimes their comment is this. No, I didn't win the race, but that was my fastest time ever. What's their point is? The point is, I am stretching forward. I am making progress, and I am not comparing myself to others. Comparing ourselves to others can be a pit, a hole, maybe even a dark hole. We shouldn't compare ourselves to others. We just run the race. Verse 14, he says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's upward call in Christ Jesus. What does this term upward call? I specifically chose this translation of upward call. Some have the term heavenly call. I don't believe that Paul is talking here about going to heaven. Neither is he talking about rapture. So what is he talking about this upward call? The upward call is the manner in which he receives the prize. That's what I'd like to suggest to you. The upward call is the manner in which he receives the prize. You say, okay, what does that mean? If you have ever seen the Olympics or something like that, when the winners or the first gold, silver medal placement, when they are called to receive their prize, they are what? They are called up to the podium. It's an upward call. You won the prize. Come on up. Get your prize. Come up to get the prize. It's the manner in which the person receives the prize. Uh, 
But the interesting thing is this. What, that's the manner of receiving the prize. What is the way of receiving the prize? What is the pathway to receive the prize? This is counterintuitive. The pathway to receive the prize is downward, even though the receiving the prize is an upward call. It's kind of like this. You want to get the, this? You got to go this first. You got to go down before you can go up. Remember that picture we had at the beginning? The pathway. It's the pathway down before it's the path up. This upward call is by means of a downward mobility. It was countercultural then, just as it is countercultural today. Dorothy Bass writes this. She says, regarding somebody else as she's reading or quoting, Susan Eastman argues that Paul is engaged in a countercultural strategy that replaces the cruel, hierarchical, upward mobility of Roman cultural values with the redemptive downward mobility of Christ and those who would imitate Christ. The culture then, which is probably very similar to the culture today, and that is, I'm always on the way up. And typically, the way up is to step on others, to beat others out. It's hierarchical. She says it's cruel. So the way is down, not the way up. The way is down. Let God be the one who brings you up. But our way is to go down. Remember those three things, to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of, of his sufferings, and being conformed to his death. You say, is this depressing? Is it depressing? You know what's striking is this. A lot of writers, when they think about the book of Philippians, where we're talking about, they think of this, this is a book of joy. This is a book of rejoicing. So how do these two, how do these two, how do you put these two things together? I would say this way. Why could, jo why could Paul, in the midst of this thought of downward mobility, yet still be in the whole attitude of joy and rejoicing? How do you put these two things together? Okay. Just think about your experience. I know it's not the same as Paul's, but you have some experience. What is the real joy? What is the real satisfaction? It is to make progress in your faith. It's to make progress in your growth, development, progress brings joy. One of my wife's aunts, she lived to 99 years of age, and what was striking about her was this. In her senior years, 60s, 70s, even into her 80s, she was constantly taking courses, learning something new. One time she even took a cruise. This is not your typical go to the Caribbean cruise. No, this is a small cruise ship where everybody was doing some learning, and they went not south, they went north. This is not a cruise for sunshine. This was a cruise to learn something about the North Atlantic. She would go to classes at university, this kind of thing. She already had a degree when she was young, but she was constantly wanting to learn. Maybe that's why she lived to 99, I don't know. Constantly learning. It gave her why? Because progress gave her satisfaction. To progress in the faith gives people even as believers, gives us some satisfaction. When we see God has done something in us, 
that gives us a certain sense of joy. So that's why Paul can be so joyful in this book. Why? He's got this whole attitude, I'm progressing, I'm going forward, I'm, I'm advancing. Well, verses 15 and 16 are kind of the conclusion to this little section. So let me leave you with these two verses, two points. Verse 15. Let me summarize it and paraphrase it. I'll paraphrase verse 15. This is Dell's version. Mature people think this way. That's my paraphrase. What way? Mature people think, what's the way? I haven't made it. I'm a work in progress. Christ has laid hold of me, and I'm progressing. I'm trying to, lay, I'm laying hold of, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my, I'm determined to lay hold of Christ to gain the prize. So, and then he kind of says, well, if you don't think this way, sooner or later, you'll think this way. That's my paraphrase. Tom Wright says, true maturity actually means knowing that you haven't arrived. What is a mature person? A mature person is one who knows that they haven't arrived and that you must keep pressing on forwards towards the goal. That's a mature person. Constantly advancing because they haven't arrived. So if somebody says to you, you haven't made it yet, just maybe you could have a retort saying, so you think you've made it? No one has made it. We all are pursuing. We all are striving forward. And then, last, second last point. Second, sorry, second point, last point. Verse 16. Wherever you are at, presently, somehow you got to that point. Keep going. Keep going. It's kind of like a runner, especially a long-distance runner, who falls. And what, do they, what does a good runner do? They get back up and start running again. They don't let that fall derail them. They get up, going again. Uh, to me, the, the best maybe example is uh, figure skating. You watch figure skating, and frequently figure skaters fall. But what makes them keep going? I'm not done yet. I haven't arrived. So I get up and just with ice on your wherever, <laughs> you keep skating. You keep skating till you get to the end. That's the kind of attitude that we should have. Forget about what happened. Keep going. Keep going. So wherever you've attained... And finally, just say this. Don't compare. Don't compare yourself to others. But instead, let yourself be affected, be influenced, be convinced by the love of God who has laid hold of you. Let that become the driving factor of your life, just like Paul. Paul's attitude, I've been laid hold of by Christ. Actually, that's a precious thing to say, I've been laid hold of by Christ. And so because of that, I want to lay hold of him. May this be our attitude. We haven't arrived. We're still going forward. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this kind of pattern that Paul has given us in this book, not only of Christ, but of himself, not having arrived, yet realizing that he has been laid hold of by you. Lord, may this be our realization today. Lord, may we be uh, controlled by this. May we be affected by this, that you have laid hold of us 
so that we could lay hold of you. And we pray that this week we would have a proper response to you. We would have a proper resolve based on what we have read and heard this morning. Lord, grasp us even more that we could grasp you more. We ask this in your dear and precious name. Amen. Amen. We have a special announcement this morning. I'm going to ask Andrea to come up and give that announcement. Hello, church. Hello. My name is Andrea. I'm part of the Compassion Ministry here at CLT. We're very excited to announce that Church in Toronto will be hosting a Christmas market on Saturday, November 26, from 7 to 9.30 p.m. At this event, we will have music, we're going to have games, delicious snacks and drinks, and even a silent auction. Please make sure to bring cash or for the small purchases, and e-transfer will be available for the silent auctions. All the funds collected at this event will go to Jesus Network and Matthew House. These are two nonprofit organizations supporting immigrants, refugees coming to Canada. Everyone is welcome at this event, and we counted on your support to make this a memorable night. Uh, if you'd like to collaborate for this event, either by donating items of value for the signing auction, volunteering, or just making a monetary donation, please make sure to fill up the form at mycit.info. It's called Christmas Markets Donations. Donations can be dropped off on Saturdays from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m., Sundays from 11 to 12 at the table in front of the kitchen, starting October 22nd until November 20th. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, have a blessed day, and I hope to see you all at the Christmas market. Thank you.